Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, a lifelong PC user, builder, and enthusiast. But for the past two months, I've been working, playing, creating, and consuming content on this 2021 24 inch iMac. This is the upgraded eight core GPU model with 16 gigabytes of memory and a 256 gigabyte SSD. And today I'm gonna share my experience with you from a PC user's perspective. I'll be covering the strengths and weaknesses of the system, hopefully helping you, the viewer, decide if you should make the switch to this Mac, either from a PC or from an older Mac. And let's start with performance. Now, I'm not gonna go too far down the rabbit hole in terms of performance metrics and benchmarks with this iMac. After all, it is the same M1 processor as the MacBook Pro and the Mac Mini, just in a new package, so I'm gonna focus more on the package. I've extensively covered the performance of the M1 Mac Mini, as well as the performance of this iMac in practical applications. I've linked those playlists in the description below, but I will reiterate what I've said about the M1 previously. For me, the M1 is probably the most impressive processor since the launch of Ryzen. And although the newer Ryzen 5000 series mobile processors released in the past few months have slightly outpaced the M1 in raw performance, I still think the M1 is the best mobile SOC or system on a chip available. Its performance per watt is unbeatable, which allows for the outstanding battery life and cool whisper quiet operation, which are all outstanding features in a mobile computer. But I'm not reviewing a laptop today. The iMac is a desktop computer. It doesn't have a battery. It's plugged into a 2000 watt wall outlet. There's not much, but more room for cooling. So those M1 features I just talked about aren't so important in this application. Just for comparison's sake, let's compare the M1 to this Ryzen 7 4700G. Now on paper, they're pretty similar. Both eight core CPUs with eight core integrated graphics, similar base clocks 3.2 and 3.6. The M1 is a five nanometer process node. The Ryzen is a seven nanometer, but the M1 SOC is considerably more advanced than the Ryzen APU. The five nanometer process is significantly more efficient, giving a huge advantage in single core performance. Not only does it have integrated encoders and a neural engine, but the DRAM is integrated into the chip and that interconnect being so fast, the processor doesn't even need L3 cache. However, in practically every measurable metrics, the 4700G outperforms the M1. The reason why comes down to basically one thing, power. While the M1 operates between five and 25 watts, the 4700G operates between 45 and 120 watts. So despite being a technologically inferior part, the Ryzen can use more power to basically brute force its way through tasks. Now, with that said, the M1 is still a snappier processor. So all single core speed operations and applications like app startup and web browsing, most of your common productivity applications and single core dependent functions like photo editing in Photoshop and 3D modeling in ZBrush in Blender, like I demonstrated in my previous videos, was awesome. Best experience I've ever had in those programs. Where the M1 lacks is in heavy multi-threaded operations and in GPU accelerated operations, like I also demonstrated in my previous videos. I mention all of that for the majority of my audience who are PC users like me, just to keep the expectations of the processor realistic. However, the weaknesses I just outlined will only be a problem for about 15% of all computer users. Mac, PC, Linux, doesn't matter. Like I've mentioned on many occasions in all my basic home office PC build guides, 85% of computer users don't need or take advantage of dedicated graphics cards. This is borne out by sales. 85% of all computers sold, your Dells, HPs, Lenovo's, and Macs 
don't have dedicated graphics cards. So if you're an average computer user, you know, you browse the web, do your home office productivity type tasks, you know, work from home, video conferencing, even some basic photo or video editing, even app development or coding, then the M1 is a great processor for that. Now, if you're in that other 15% and you do more advanced content creation, like 100 plus megapixel, several dozen layer Photoshop edits, complex multicam video edits with moderate to heavy use of GPU accelerated effects or filters and any 3D rendering or 3D like game development, then the M1 isn't a great option. And whether you want that M1 performance in the $900 Mac mini or this $1,700 iMac, that's what we'll discuss next. And I'll start with what makes an iMac an iMac, and that's the display. And right off the bat, the more I use the iMac, the less I like the display. Now, don't get me wrong. It is a great display. And for probably 90% of people, it will be one of the best displays they've ever seen. But it does have some weaknesses. Now, this is the part of the review that's, you know, kind of subjective. I'm not gonna go into all the tech specs of the display. Those are readily available. I'm just gonna tell you about my viewing experience and how some of the specifications affected that. First, the positives. For any productivity tasks or web browsing, it's awesome. Text is very sharp, viewing angles are great, zero screen door effect, I can't see individual pixels at all. Ghosting is minimal. I mean, it is a 60 hertz display, so there is, of course, some ghosting, but it's it's not a gaming display, so it really doesn't matter. 500 nits of peak brightness is way more than is even necessary for most computing tasks. Now for the weaknesses. First, color accuracy, or more accurately, the color profile. At first, was really bad. It was way too warm. I mean, more than warm, it was orange. And then I turned off True Tone, but it was still slightly on the warm side, which I was able to fix by manually adjusting the white point. But the color profile is still too saturated. It's pretty much equivalent to the vivid color setting on a standard display. The other problem I saw was with contrast ratio and mostly black levels, or more specifically, the HDR profile, because to be honest, what I did the most on the iMac was consume content. I activated my one year Apple TV subscription and I ended up binging two seasons of For All Mankind. It's a great show. Anyway, I was able to watch it in 4K HDR, but while the iMac display does support HDR content, this display is another example of the varying and different HDR specifications between TVs and computer monitors. I'm not gonna get into that whole debate right now. I'll just say typically HDR content like the Apple TV series I watched was intended to be watched on, well, a TV that meets at least HDR 10 specs. Most HDR rated monitors don't meet all of those specs. As far as this one, it is at least a 10-bit display. 500 nits of peak brightness is okay. I'm not sure what total brightness is. I also don't know what the contrast ratio or black level is, but it isn't great for an HDR display. And this was hugely apparent when watching HDR content because while bright scenes look great, good contrast, vivid colors, you know, very bright, dark scenes are very muddled and hard to make out. And this is mostly due to black levels. The black level just can't get low enough, so different levels of black just blend together. Now, all of this is forgivable because with the exception of watching HDR content or working with like dark images in Photoshop, it wasn't very noticeable. Now, this is obviously more subjective, but I don't like glossy screens at all. I don't like any reflection or glare on my display. It's not just you know, psychologically distracting, it's also physically distracting as a bright glare or reflection will make it physically more difficult to perceive contrast. Now, I know I'm probably being a bit overcritical of the display, but again, the display is what makes an iMac an iMac and is the main reason you're paying like $800 more for the iMac than say the M1 Mac mini. But realistically, 
there aren't many HDR monitors out there in the sub $1,000 range that are better than this one. And probably most importantly, this display is immeasurably better than the 21.5 inch display on the base model iMac it's replacing. If you're moving up from the 1080p 8-bit display on the old iMac, I mean, this one will knock you off your chair. There is no contest there. This is, I mean, on such a different level, you just can't compare the two. As far as the 21.5 inch 4K retina display, I don't have hands-on or more accurately eyes-on experience with that particular display. Other than the two inch size difference spec-wise, they're about the same. But if anyone watching has that eyes-on experience with both, let us know in the comments what you think. But I guess to summarize, great display, huge upgrade over the previous base model, but not perfect. Now. Let's talk about what impressed me more and more over the past two months, and that's the speakers. Now, in my unboxing and initial impression video, I liked the speakers overall for what they were. Six downfiring drivers in the 11.5 millimeter thin chin, the sound was impressive, and the observations I made are still pretty valid. They were good for voice, like watching your favorite YouTuber, but for music, I thought they were a bit underwhelming. Decent bass response, good volume with just a little distortion at the highest level, but they were very tinny, which thanks to the iFixit teardown video, we know that the speakers use metal resonance chambers behind the display, so I guess that makes sense. Now, where these speakers really shine is in surround sound emulation. Now, it's not room filling sound, unless I guess your room is the size of a closet, but while I was watching the Dolby Atmos content, there was definitely a good sense of directionality in the sound. This is Dolby Atmos. The number of speakers around you no longer matters because this is the world's first object-based cinematic audio. <laughs> with powerful moving audio that transcends from channels to moving around you with 10 point accuracy. And again, not 360 degree sound like true 7.1 surround, but it was very close to a 180 degree sound stage. So directional sounds weren't pinpoint accurate, but were close enough for a good level of immersion. So while listening to music was more enjoyable on a good quality set of headphones, they definitely weren't necessary while watching Apple TV content. Next is the built-in camera and speakers. And while I did do a fair bit of FaceTiming and video chatting over the past couple months on this side of the camera, it's hard to judge the quality. So I'll once again let you be the judge. This is unfiltered, unedited audio and video from the built-in camera and microphones. I'll start with the camera and this is ideal studio lighting. So I would expect it to look great, so let's switch to more realistic lighting. And this is just typical overhead room lighting. Uh, let's add some background lighting. So this is background lighting illuminating from the rear of the image. Now let's go with a completely dark room. And now basically the only light source is the display itself. So let's go with the microphone test now and test that voice isolation. So again, this is a quiet studio setting. It should sound pretty good. Now some typing to see how it does with noise rejection. Not that a magic keyboard is very loud. And let's turn on my air conditioner. Now that rear mic should pick up that air conditioner and hopefully reject it. So let's add some ambient noise to the mix. And admittedly, this is a bit louder than I typically like the environment in a video call, but I don't know, how's the voice isolation and noise cancellation doing here? I just went back and looked and listened to those clips I just recorded and my impression was the video quality was great and adapted to well to all the lighting conditions and is definitely a big step up for Mac which has been stuck at 720p for way too long. However, while voice isolation was pretty good, the noise rejection was not great. 
the keyboard sounded louder on the video than it actually did for real, and the steady state air conditioner noise being behind the Mac should have been rejected more. Now, as far as the form factor and design of the iMac, I went into a lot of detail about that in my initial impressions video, and not much has changed over the past two months. The white bezels were, were fine for the most part, and again, was only slightly distracting while watching like dark scenes and video content, and again, didn't really help with contrast perception while working with darker images. The chin, whatever, I forgot it was there. The 11.5 millimeter super slim design. I mean, I sit 18 to 20 inches from the screen. My desk is 29 inches deep. So again, it's a neat, hey, look what we can do for Apple, but practically for most people, it's not really advantageous. However, there are instances where it can be beneficial. And I think in the permanent location I have in mind for this iMac, the thinness will be very practical. So stay tuned for that. But now let's get to the conclusion. And should you consider the 2021 iMac? First, if you're considering upgrading from an older base model 21.5 inch iMac with the 1080p display and Intel i3 in the base Intel HD graphics, then this is a huge upgrade. If you have a newer one with the 4K display and i5 or even i7 CPU and the upgraded Radeon or Vega Pro graphics, then this will be less of an upgrade and probably not very cost effective just yet. Now, if you're just someone looking for an all-in-one, you don't care if it's a PC, Mac, whatever, then I'm gonna make the call and say, this is a really good option. In my experience with modern all-in-one PCs, while not equal, they're all about the same. In most cases, their mobile components uh, like a mobile Intel or Ryzen CPU utilizing integrated or low power mobile graphics tightly integrated into a display. And while some have some user upgrade options for memory and storage, most are just as non-user serviceable as this and most don't include this level of display, speakers, or even webcam. And to be completely subjective, the price to performance between this iMac and similarly performing and spec to all-in-one PCs, I'd say favors the iMac. I can't believe I'm staying that. So which model iMac to buy then? Well, again, for 85% of people who just use a computer to do basic productivity tasks like Office 365 work, web browsing, streaming media, video chatting, then the base model with the seven core GPU and eight gigabytes of memory is gonna be just fine. If you do more content creation, coding or app development, web development, or serious office work like mega number crunching or work in complex databases, then this upgraded model with the eight core GPU and 16 gigs of memory is probably a better choice. As far as storage, unless you have a massive amount of applications to install or data you wanna store locally on the system, I'd save the money and go with the 256 or 512 gigabyte SSDs and use cloud storage or get a good external drive. And for more insight into the M1 Mac or the M1 Mac mini, be sure to check out these playlists here and don't forget to subscribe for future content. I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.